Hi everybody and thanks for tuning in to the Run the Hills podcast. This is episode 93, sponsored by Chia Charge. Chia Charge have been fueling adventures with real food made with real ingredients since 2012. Go and check them out at www.chiacharge.co.uk. Ah, again, I'm relaxing. One to take Gary. I think everybody, when they hear you start doing the intro, do you think they're like, oh no, oh no. It's Gary. You never know. I can just edit it out and be smooth. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I'm very curious. You know, like I listen to other podcasts, and um, they all seem really slick. Uh, yeah, are they one take uh, wonders, or it's like this uh, about twenty takes down the line before they get what they're happy with? But, but um, that's not why people tune in. They tune in to hear the mundane and yeah. the shy of very dull <laughs> boring lives. <laughs> We're talking about mundane. Uh, what have you been up to? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> across the line there. Sorry. <laughs> so truthful. We are, we are thirsty. It's very hard when you don't when you're a mum and life just is the same. The same. But I've got some stories for you. I got some stories for you. So let's start with running because you know that's why we're actually hired. Uh, so we're back. We're back to an hour's running, Gary. I did an hour. I broke the hour barrier on Sunday with Bryn um it was it, i made a few errors because i couldn't get on my bike until late saturday evening so i did that quite late and it was a really hard session and then if i i find if i train really late in the evening i can't i find it really hard to refuel afterwards especially yeah. bike because i'm so hot um so i didn't really have very much to eat and then we went out running the next early the next morning and i didn't i not feel my peppiest Ooh, yeah, anyway yeah. we did quite a, it's uh, it's not a, it's my everyday run normally but as you know, these benchmarks, it's like, it felt like a freaking marathon. <laughs> and there's a tiny little hill. So it's all it's all uphill all the way out and they turn around to come back. Anyway, there's a tiny little hill at the end, just through this little trees. It's rocky and rooty. And I literally had to walk it. And Bryn was like, turn around. And he'd gone. And he was like, waiting at the top of it. And he's like, you're right, babe. What's up? I was like, I'm absolutely, I'm fine. I just can't, I'm knackered, nothing left. Bryn loves it. Bryn's like, feels like, I bet he does, yeah. My time has come. Uh, and he's like, I'm like, this is like when you, um, when I used to travel on and I used to be front crawling and the girl in front of me used to backstroke and like, just look at me because, and I was like sprinting. I was like, yeah. this is what it's like. And you're chatting away and I'm just going. <gasps> oh, goodness me. I hope some people can just chat away. I, well, I'm always a heavy breather. Any Gary, any any activity is a lot of heavy breathing. <laughs> even like even anything, running, going up the stairs, shopping. Yeah. I'm out of breath. I do it sometimes to distract you, the runners, or like over ham up me breathing. Well, also when I'm racing, I forget how heavy breathing I am, and other <laughs> runners look at me and like, oh my god, she's dying. I'm like, no, it's One just mile the whole time anyway i was really pleased i've just done another hour i did my other staple hour route my dog my dog run when i've dropped the kids off and it's up it's quite um it's got about 1300 feet of elevation over 10k it's nice i'm at i could run the whole thing so that's always like that's always my benchmark you can run that run yeah. I just, as we were, as we were um, <clears throat> chatting, I'd like to say as we were like preparing, we just got it, don't we? And then we press record. Yeah. I was like, made the mistake of looking at a Strava segment and then I'm not going to do that again. No. Don't do that again, Eddie. But I did manage to run, oh, my legs feel like freakishly strong, um, but my ankle feels as weak as a puppy. And so the physio said, because the Achilles has been so swollen, like the ligaments all around, I haven't been able to work. Yeah. Um, and so th- I literally like every other foot I go over on my ankle. So oh, I have to wow. come down, this one, I have to come down. It's really like steep, rocky piece and it's been raining. And I was just like Bambi. I was like, step, step. Oh, oh, step, step oh. Yeah, yeah. I wonder anyway. what the time frame is for that then, as you kind of said. Well, you're... I'm doing all my like wobble board stuff and I keep going, oh, well, when does it get stronger? How much, how many hours do I have to spend? Yeah. I have been given permission to, to cut down slightly on the calf raises. Okay. Uh, which is so, honestly, that's so much time every day to be going up and down on a step without <laughs> popping up and down. But now that I'm adding more running, the physio said that's a lot of load to then load as yeah. well on the step. So now I can just do that in the gym every other day so that is that's nice good to hear did i make this some been some significant progress another big bit of progress last week 
I said, I ran with a mate for the first time. And these are all little steps, aren't they? And your injury come back when you feel like, okay, I could run with someone without yeah, yeah. Um, the heavy breathing and also having feeling guilty because you keep having to go and walk a bit. Late. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a big uh, Point de Neon, which is my mountain literally to the left of my house. And uh, it's 1,000 me- 1, meters to the top. I know my mate said, I'm going to do that. I was like, oh, no, Eddie can't do that yet. But I'll come up to the plateau as it sort of goes up first. And then you go the steep climb. Of course, of course, we got going. I was like, I'm not going to. I know where this is going. <laughs> you know where this is going. I'm not going to. I haven't taken anything because I thought I'm literally going to oh, go up goodness. for an hour, half an hour. I'm not going to take anything. <laughs> I've taken like a tiny little bit of water. I didn't take my poles or anything. Um, so she's really tall. Um, and so about halfway at the climb, I said, can I use your balls? <laughs> because the Achilles definitely uh, was like pulling a little bit. The, the physio the day before had said, do half an hour easy on the flat and see how it goes. Oh, I <laughs> you did see my Instagram story when I was like two and a half hours, 1,100 meters of climbing. Anyway, we got it climbing. It's fine. It's all hiking. It's just really steep and stony so it's quite hard if you haven't got a fully functioning ankle but it's lovely up there the views are great and yeah, we took i took one dog took lindy got up and then i was like oh this is gonna be a bit miserable coming down it's really rocky it was a bit wet i wasn't sure the ankle was gonna hold me up down so yeah. we decided to come down the other side of the mountain which is steeper but soft loads of switchbacks came down there of course two ladies together running chat 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 chat. not really concentrating at the bottom of this um mountain there's a man-made lake which i presume is for like snow cannon water they fill it up every summer but you're not allowed to swim in it you're not allowed to fish in it it's just a puddle of water somebody will correct me and go that's what it's for anyway (laughs) so it's it's totally man-made so these sides of it are made of corrugated iron flat so you can't you wouldn't be able to get in and out well you could get in but you'd never be able to get out it's only half full so we're coming down this mountain as i mentioned previously we've got one dog with me one dog the young crazy dog who i've taken no notice of because she just potters around while we're running and she doesn't go anywhere anyway as we were going down to this lake i suddenly saw this dog in the lake she can't oh, get out because she's me. into the water and it's surround it's a huge lake it must be 400 meters across. Oh, wow. Um, yep. uh, she can't get out because she's gone into the water and now she, there's no there's no way for her to get out. How am I going to get into this lake? This is really stressful. Oh, this is really stressful. This is, so we ran, so we sort of like looked at her, me and my mate, and we were like, what? And then we were like, oh my God, the dog is actually starting to drown because yes. she's like against the side and she can't get out. What will you do? I started, this is where I disappointed myself because mm. I started to panic, Gary. I started to panic and I was like, oh, Lindy, Lindy. Anyway, these two guys appeared from nowhere, these happy hikers, and they were like, body panic, body panic. They got the kit off. <laughs> they the kit off. One of them scoot down the tarpaulin down, oh. and we got Lindy to swim yeah. all the way around the lake to yeah. where they were filling it up with a hose, whatever, okay. pipe, <laughs> and we got her to climb up against this, like, slightly rickety bit of the tarpaulin. Um, not tarpaulin, what's it called? Um, up, and we got her out there. It took us about 10 minutes. Oh and the whole goodness. time, her head was starting to go under the... Gary. Oh, Eddie, this is... Oh, <laughs> Gary. Do you know what? Uh, do you know what? I was on the edge. I was ready. Like, I wanted to stay there because I thought if I go down, she might stop trying to get out and coming yeah. around. But do you know what I made? I made it... I was like, I would die for my dog. I will go in now. I might yeah. not be able to get out myself. But I will go in and I'll hold your head up and I would actually go under and hold my dog's head up. <laughs> anyway, we got her halfway round. We got her out and I was like just lying, cuddling her. She had no idea. She got out. She shook yeah. herself up, gave her a biscuit. Off she went. <laughs> <facing Marmots. laughs> you guys, what heroes. They loved it. They were like, mm, maybe next time you'll remember and I, yeah. that you thought that there's the lake is only half full. And I was like... Yeah, humble pie, humble pie. So sorry, thank you so much. You got very wet. I hope you're okay. Make a quick exit because what would you do? I was like, I can't. What can I pay you in? Normally, I have little funny stories. Eddie. This is like really good. It's <laughs> really quite sad. We ran away. We ran away quickly because we were obviously a bit embarrassed by the whole situation yeah. and a bit like shocked. And I was like, I, I was like, oh, Lindy. Anyway, I told my mate who also got dogs. I said, don't you know? Don't go up to this lake. It's it's only half full. It's a really dangerous. Dog. Yeah. She's like, my dog won't go in. Won't go in. I said, I'd have said the same about Lindy. Next day, WhatsApp message. Oh my God. Went in, had to go. I was like, oh my God. 
This is, it's, a, it's a dangerous place. You're bringing your dogs to more dangerous places. Anyway, I was, I was thinking, uh, that's amazing that I felt like I would, I'd never realised I loved my dog so much that I would actually have gone in. Like a flight, isn't it? I'd have, been the head, I'd have been Daily Mail, absolute tabloid follow mother of three dogs, has the whole head up, has the whole dog's head up. I think Bryn would have been happy though that I saved the dog. And the I dog yeah, the dog always gets out, doesn't it? That's the yeah, the dog always gets out. At the end, the dog will get out and yeah. mum died, but you know, the dog made it and everyone was happy. End of the story. Anyway, moral of the story is keep an eye on your dogs when you're running. Mm. Don't get carried away. And thank you to the kind men. I don't even know what they look like because I spent the whole time panicking, even though they were going paddy penny, paddy penny. <laughs> I find that sometimes, you know, something quite significant happened and you're a bit wrapped up in the moment. You don't really acknowledge some people that need no, it. No, that's you? it. That's it. Yeah. And also, my French is okay, but as soon as I, whenever I get in like a really tricky situation, I completely forget any French. I find it yeah. impossible to communicate. Um, and I just am a bit mute or speak a strange language that doesn't make sense. Anyway. I'm pretty sure they listen to this show, Eddie, so they'll... Oh, big fans, no doubt. <laughs> anyway, it's all done. Um, uh, the other thing that I quite enjoyed, Gary, is the Jubilee weekend. I mean, nobody here had a clue what was that was all about. Did you have the bunting out? No, we didn't have any of that. Oh, my God, no, we wouldn't dare do that. We're in a real... <laughs> surrounded by French farmers but we did um I did watch the uh highlights on what well, oh it made me oh the bit with Paddington Bear and the Queen did you cry I didn't see any of it what you didn't watch oh, anything you not got no. a, you not got a nostalgic bone in your body it's uh, I don't want to go into too much into it, but it's not really my cup of tea. <laughs> it's not. I like. I find. I know where you're getting at, but I did really enjoy seeing. I guess because I'm not in England, I really enjoyed seeing. Yeah. Uh, the concert, seeing all that military pomp and ceremony, because <clears throat> I grew up with that as well. I was just talking about this, talking to Lisa on the way home yesterday, because there's lots of bunting up still in the village, and uh, I think there's a bit of a, you know, if you have your Union Jack up in your garden, it's frowned upon by some members of the community but it's fine at the moment i wonder when it's okay. not fine to have the union jack up yeah. again well you'll soon tell us keep us updated anyway let's talk more running what you've been doing <laughs> you're a bit you're much more sprightly you're making eye contact with me this week you've had a better week you know what yeah i don't feel so wrecked this week i think it wasn't the first week in three i've actually i've choose i'm thinking yeah, I feel all right. Not so bad today. Yeah. But a good week last week. Um, pretty steady. Twenty hours total exercise. Some walking in that, but pretty much twenty hours. Not huge elevation. There's no tails this week. Actually, all mine is just admin running. <laughs> no, no, no huge elevation. About seven thousand feet. Not too bad. About eighty miles. So yeah, pretty solid. But I did. So this is what I always do. I, I, I never kind of layer too many things on at once. So I did three quality sessions last week. Um, so that's why I wasn't really paying attention to the elevation. And I did a 25-minute threshold run in the nature reserve. So that was good. And I did a midweek long run. I hadn't done one of these for ages. Uh, and then six miles of that were at this kind of sub-threshold, which I suppose would be your marathon pace if you were on the flats. And that was good. on your heart rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, um, I think it's like low 140s or something like that should be uh, for that. So that was nice. Did that and it was about 15 mile in total. So it was like six mile sandwich in the. I, I did three. Off of that on Strava. You really? <laughs> I should really pay more attention to Strava. I'm such a bad follow. Uh, and then I did my classic five, three times 1K sandwich, but it starts off with two 10 minutes. So it's, sorry, it's one 10 minutes, then three times 5K. Three times, oh God, Gary, start again. 10 minutes, five times 1K, and then 10 minutes. All at threshold pace, and you have 90 seconds in between all of those. And that's quite a big, quite a big session on the trip. But you can't even explain it, let alone I know, yeah, it. I, it's always a worry when I have to explain stuff. But I think I didn't, well, I know I didn't fuel enough because... I just couldn't generate um, the speed and I couldn't get my heart rate up for the probably the, the last third of the session. So I was running and I felt tired, but I just, just couldn't get my heart rate. It was at the low end of the zone four. It never mm. really got to that mid part of zone four, which I like to, to be in. Um, so I was always within the range, which is not the part of the range that I want to be in. So yeah, silly, silly boy, really. I should have took some more food with me and ate on that. But um, 
other than that lots of mobility work that was good i did my all my strength sessions that was good loads of foam rolling loads of uh ice in my knee and a lot more stretching that I was, you know, just sitting down watching the TV stretching. So that's all fine. And I do, you know, I think last week I was saying, I think I'm kind of hovering around a six, seven out of 10 for my training. I feel, yeah, I feel a bit better about this week. I'm a bit more focused and I had a lovely, on Sunday, I had a lovely social run with some people from Sanctuary Larry's and, uh, that was it. Like I already mentioned, I pretty much skipped the Jubilee. <clears throat> I appreciated the two days off. Uh, that was nice. Um, but yeah, skipped the Jubilee celebrations. And yeah, a nice social run on Sunday. Ran to McDonald's, had a coffee, ran back Stop again. <laughs> Where's the McDonald's? Uh, it's a little, well, it's a bit too uh, niche geography, but it's about seven miles from me. It's a little place called Dalton Park, which is like a shopping centre. And there's a McDonald's there. So we ran there and back. Um and that is pretty much it. There's, I was thinking last night, surely something interesting has happened to me this week. And um, no, not... <laughs> You've got no dog in a pond. To <laughs> yeah, well. I wouldn't have enjoyed that. But yeah, no no, no little uh, stories to share, unfortunately. But a uh, pretty good week of running, so I can't complain. We had some breakers over the bank holiday. These people weren't, these people weren't supporting Jubilee either, though they probably enjoyed watching it in, with their feet up afterwards. Grand Union Canal Race, which runs from Birmingham to London along the canal, a classic in the Canalathon, as I see it's now called, series yeah. of Canalathon races. <laughs> one outright won by a lady. I think this is the first race, big ultra race in the calendar I've seen that has been won by a lady. Like I know there's been lots of, you know, smaller races oh, that, that I've put yeah. money on it and say, while my ears have been to the ground of ultra running, that this is, this is in the, a big win by a woman yeah. um, for a big, big, well-known ultra race in England. Sam Amend, who we are talking to in only a few minutes. Wow. Uh, one in 25 hours, 45 minutes. What a year she's had so far, and I want to know how she does it, and I want it. I want her powers of recovery. And Ian Hammett, who we've not had on the show, but we should as well. No. 27 hours, 48 minutes. He actually said to me when I ran my... First hundred, I was running with him, and I think we were like 40 miles in, and I said to him, I don't, I can't do it, Ian. I can't do it, it's such a long way. How do you do it? And he said, Eddie, you can always run 10K. You can always run 10K. Yeah. If your life depended on it, you could run 10K. And I was like, okay, okay, I can always run 10K. Never gotten that. Uh, thanks, Ian. Never gotten that. Always look at that. that you yeah. When I went from running like massive long distances and I'm like, God, oh, do it so far. And I'm like, always run 10k. Always run 10K. We're gonna ask uh, her what a what a uh, my average uh pace per mile was because 25 hours, uh, 145 mile. It's pretty it's shifting. It's shifting, isn't it? And Sarah yeah. Sawyer, friend of the show, came fourth. What yeah. a run for her. She must be really pleased with that. 29 hours and 50 seconds. Well done. Oh, with a pint of beer at the finish. Oh, I saw her with her head in a plate of <laughs> chips as well. <laughs> oh, I'm like, yes, come on, someone show reality. <laughs> Completely opposite race. Don't think you could get more different. Well, yeah, again, another question I was going to ask, what the elevation was. I wonder if, just bizarrely, it's quite a lot of elevation on the canal. Um, no, I, rec I reckon there's probably about, well, you can ask as well, can't we? 2,000 feet, probably, something like that. Yeah, which over that distance. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think Tom Evans must have had, oh, crikey, well... 10, well double figures, yeah, not about 10,000, but it's, it's going to yeah. be pretty, pretty good. But, yeah, Tom Evans was... Race at the weekend, and he took the win and a new course record at Scarfeld Sky Race. Four hours, 30 minutes and 54 seconds. And I, I'm a bit of a, I've got a bit of a crush on Tom, I think. <laughs> he just seems to hit all the right notes. I, I, I don't know what it is. You know, he just has a real good way about him. And he, they said he's going to have a tip at the uh, course record. And um, I think I said again last week, it must be quite stressful to have this target on your back. But um, yeah, he did it and he got the course record. So awesome. And uh, John Gina Tindley for the ladies, uh, 5, 48 and 36 minutes. Awesome. And it was great to see Mark Derbyshire was out running again. I think he was, uh, oh my goodness, just under five hours. So, you know, Tom had a pretty much a half an hour gap. So it might not have felt like a, a race, more of a time trial for him, but to still push and go for it and get the course record. 
And Mark pretty- said um, he's on, he's in my Centurion team, and he said it was really hot, and there was only one aid station for the whole race. He didn't Brilliant. have to feel Ooh, that's how you like you like those, don't you, Gary? <laughs> but nice also to see Jason Cavill out racing, our uh, guest former guest of the show and friend of the show. I think he came fifth overall, so awesome. Yeah, well done, everybody. Great weekend of racing. And as we speak, I uh, probably will be finished. They've got the or oh, the three peaks is going on at the moment. And I think they're they're going today. They're off to oh. they're off to Scarfell again. Um so yeah it's kind of great to see those guys progress. Is there a tracker for that? There is a tracker. It's on <clears throat> I've just been following along on their uh Facebook group. Pretty the good. other thing I'm following is the Run Britannia rat race recce thing. Have you seen this? Oh, no. Um, Ali Bailey, who is the first person that ever interviewed for the podcast. And I and I didn't, it didn't work because of the, I didn't know how to record and stuff. Oh. <laughs> anyway, they're doing this practice <laughs> run of um, from Land's End to John O'Groats, but they're going via all the national trails. Ooh. So it's really worth following her, um, Ali Bailey, on Instagram. She does like three or four or five stories all day, and they're running yeah. uh, every single day. They run between like it's between like twenty five and forty five miles. There's about six of them. I'm just watching. It's like um, you know, when you're watching, what do you call it? When you're watching something, you're just waiting. You just know that this is going to be just so hard. Yeah. But uh, it looks so cool, and they're running it as a race next year. And the year after, 35 days, over 35 days, you can run the length fully supported, but on all these paths. Like um, it. and it's already really inspiring. Out. Like yeah. we've seen stuff like that. And then with this uh, the three peaks challenge and the Grand Union Canal. We need just... to up our game. My hour run is not gonna wash it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me want to do new and different adventures. It's great to see. This week's guest is Paul Mason, runner of extreme distances. Tell us, tells us all about how he conquered 500 miles. 500 miles, Eddie. I can't, uh, I can't imagine it. I can't, I can't imagine doing 250 miles and then knowing that you're just going to have to do it again. And it's not, that's not even the event. The event was 250 miles. It's just, I'm going to do it twice. It's not, you know, it's not the physical thing. Cause I'm pretty sure if I put my mind to most physical things, if I had to do it, do it. it's the le- it's the living with your brain yeah. all that time of the fight to do it. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Quiet, isn't it? sorry. <laughs> but trigger warning. If uh, anyone's a bit kind of freaked out by clowns, he had some <clears throat> pretty graphic hallucinations. So if you're in the lawn in the dark along the canal, uh, and you're particularly scared by clowns, it's probably a good idea to uh, fast forward this one. Or listen to it, the safety of your home with all the lights yeah. on. It did scare us, didn't us? We both got like goosebumps and were like, oh, no, stop. But yeah, it was great to catch up with Paul. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for coming on today. Where are you? How are you? And have you been for run today? Okay, so where am I? So I live in a, a small town in Hertfordshire called Ware, which is W-A-R-E, which normally causes lots of jokes of where's that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a little town called Ware, right on the um, Hart Sussex border. Uh, how am I? Yeah, that's a good question. So what I'm now, day 16 after coming off the 500. So I think you come off of an event like that on a real high I would say I'm probably now down in what I call the valley now, um, which is a really interesting place. So it's a place, I guess, where I'm I'm reflecting a lot, uh, resting clearly, um, planning, learning. Um, Yeah, it's an exciting place. Some people see it's quite a negative. I actually quite like being down in the valley because you can just think about everything you've done, everything you did well, everything you didn't go well. And documented a lot of that and journaled a lot of that so yeah i'd say i'm in a good place actually um not in not in that kind of low where people talk about coming off those big events on although i'm i mean i'm just too busy really keeping the mind mind active positively about you know we got it done that's brilliant yeah and and how would we do it better next time and how we go further and what have we learned and and that's just that constant desire to, to grow I suppose individually um there's so much more to offer at the moment so that really excites me so I like being down in this kind of moment of reflection 
um, ready to bounce back up on the next peak and have another go that, at something that else. That moment of reflection is when you've completed something is quite different to when you haven't completed something, isn't it? When you yeah. are in that, that post-race uh, big or big event blue in yeah. that valley, it's quite a different-sided valley compared to if you've done well yeah. and if you haven't. Well, you give, yeah, you give yourself a pat on the back, clearly, to start with, to say, well done, you didn't quit. You know, quitting was never on the table. Um, be it, I'm sure my team will tell you there probably were moments when I wanted to. Um, but no, I think you're right. I think I, I alluded to the point, the Thames ring back in, what's 15, when I, when I DNF'd, I forced myself to learn... Uh, and, and force myself to get back out there two years later and, you know, make it happen and, and put those learns right, because I knew I was better than that. Um, and that's not being conceited or arrogant. That was just uh, didn't give my full account. Um, this time round, it was, you know what, you got it done, well done. However, there's still a lot more in the tank. You know, there's still so much more to offer. Um, and I know there's more to offer, and I think that's just the limiting beliefs I'll put in the way if I don't think that. Yeah. So uh, it's really exciting to think, okay, if I could rewind eight days, what would I have done differently? And there's lots of things I'd have done differently. Um, so much went right, by the way. So don't get me wrong. I'm not just focusing on the negatives. The positives were huge. You know, it's probably one of my most fulfilling ultras all round when you categorize all of the key components, you know, hydration, nutrition, feet, sleep management, you know, just getting through the pain cave. Yeah. It was one of the best I've ever done, but there were still flaws in it. Um, and that's the bit that excites me because when the flaws come and you're feeling a little bit weak in the mind and the body starts to give up, you know you can do more. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't physically strong enough looking back. And I, that's my first observation. I called myself out probably even at the end of the first loop. You know, about, I'm sure we'll talk about it. My, my back went into spasm. And I wasn't physically strong enough. I was mentally strong enough and I was... Um, uh, fitness wise i was strong enough don't get me yeah. wrong the miles have gone in but i wasn't physically strong enough in body and you know and it takes a hell of a lot of pounding um just doing 250 um but 500 is a different ball game and i i, I curse myself for the fact that I, I i got through it but it could have been a lot quicker and it could have been a lot easier as well mm. um so they're the learns you know you go right okay so what can i do differently what should i have done differently and what will i do differently because next time i won't make those mistakes you know if i'm standing on a start line of another whatever it might be a yeah. long one and we're talking sort of 500 pluses those mistakes ain't happening again you know i'm not going through that pain um which i inflicted on myself you know that was my my fault nobody else's fault it was my fault i didn't put the time in in the gym enough and i was nursing a bad back to be fair prior to the event so it didn't help either so there's an excuse number one um, but again, I got the bad back because again, I didn't do it. So it's a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy. You've, you've got to put the work in the gym and I hate the gym. Were you Physically. concerned about that though, before you toured the line? Uh, I was mindful of it. Um, I, you know, I finished Thames ring 250s generally on a bit of a slant. Um, last year was probably my strongest year where I didn't. And I put a lot of work in, in the gym. So therefore why I didn't do it this time around, I don't know. Probably I was just being, I used different excuses. Work got in the way. The back went to therefore had to protect it, couldn't find enough time. All the usual BS excuses that we all find in life, you know, not enough time. I just didn't make the time. Um, and I've promised, well, I've, I've insisted on myself now that, you know, this part of being down in the valley is about getting back into the gym slowly and, and doing the right stuff. And I will spend a year in the gym and I will come out the other side and be that much stronger. Mm. Um, so, no, I don't, was I, I was mindful very mindful but not concerned because i've kind of gone through a point where things have given up before and i've got through it so yeah. i knew if the pain really kicked in i got enough mental strength to plow through it um so that's taken some time to evolve but um so yeah i think if the body was good i was i, I really just needed to break an ankle or a leg or i wasn't you know i wasn't going to finish in my own mind um and that didn't happen so therefore no excuses I love your outlook to being down the valley because even a successful race, I've not enjoyed my time in the valley. <laughs> I think it's yeah. Uh, yeah. you're using it as a real positive time to reflect. Yeah, and, uh, build it. it. It's the growth. It's the growth side of it, and that's the bit for me that the constant growth is so important for all of us. I think you know whether it's running or non-running, uh, and I think some people can see that. I can see why people, when they come down in the valley, get really depressed and really down about it because you've done all the great work, all the work's behind you, the journey's done, tick, you've got the medal, you've had the accolades, now what? 
and people well, stop I, you know i often think it's where you meet yourself sometimes down yeah. in that valley as well because yeah. you're kind of stripped bare you're really exhausted you've done yeah. it you've been you know everything's gone away and it can be a bit of a dark place where you have to face up be just be with yourself you know your your normal routine is gone your normal um you know how you feel fit and healthy normally as runners we feel like a bit invincible don't we just yeah. everyday life and you're suddenly not and you're stripped a bit yeah. bare yeah um, I, last part of my question that we haven't touched is, have you been up for a run today? Sorry, I haven't answered that one yet. No. Um, and the answer to the question is an interesting one. I'll try my, the answer is simply is no. Yeah. Um, I gave myself, I initially gave myself what I would call three weeks from race to get back to running. And as usual, I'm usually impatient. My legs recovered really quickly. My body recovered really quickly. The swelling went down. And my legs, I thought, were pretty much back to normal. I'd done some good walking, stretching, been to physio. So foolishly, I, I started running at the weekend and I only did a six miler, easy pace, no dramas. It was great to be back out there. However, Saturday night, the legs just went into like meltdown where all of the, all of the pain came back. I went back out on the Sunday and it, it, the only way I can explain it, and I'm sure runners will understand this, is having knives stabbed into the side of your IT bands. So I decided yesterday to be smart and back off, went back to physio and had some needling and some work. And I went out for a, a walk this morning and that was nice just to get out in the fresh air, the sun shining along the river. And that's great. And there's no drama with that. It's just when I'm not mobile, I'm sitting down, they do stiffen up. Um, so I've got some deep tissue damage in there, which is inevitable after 500 miles of running. Um, but I'm just impatient. I just want to get back out and do what we all love. And that's running. There's nothing better from a well-being point of view when you're out there in the sunshine running. Uh, you know, you're untouchable, aren't you? You feel fantastic. You feel great. Yeah. It doesn't matter what crap's coming in your world. Everything <laughs> lifts. Well, for me, it lifts away. You know, my well-being just elevates a level um, where you just you are untouchable. You feel great. And when you can't do it or you're trying to restrict yourself, it's really hard. Mm. Um, so I have to be patient. So this week I've kind of promised myself I won't put the trainers back on to run. I'll assess it at the weekend and then slowly build up. But I'm, I'm like any other runner. I just want to get back out there and run. I want to get back out there and race. Uh, I see all these races on social media. I just want to be there. I just want to be out there with a the running family, enjoying it. You know, it doesn't have to be about running fast. It's just being back out there and participating and doing what I love. You know, do you really miss that during uh, yeah. COVID, during lockdown? Uh, no, no, because we've got a treadmill in, in, uh, in the house anyway. So I'm quite lucky. So I can still run. Yeah. And I guess that once a day out there made full use of it. And actually, it was a really good reset for me. So actually, I was training every day. Yeah. Um, and I made a, I made a purpose because work was pretty stressful at that time. Everything kind of went into chaos. Uh, and I had literally that hour every day to, to discipline myself. And it became a real habit where I did a bit of a running streak, which I'd never really done before. So I, I strung 100 days together, which for me was quite a lot of days. I'd never gone 100 days. And I felt awesome out the back of it every day, getting out there in the sunshine. And, and, and that helped me tackle work. And, and I guess the COVID piece, because it was really strange, wasn't it? It was very bizarre. Yeah. Um, but no, I came through that. Uh, in a better place, I'd say, if anything. It was a, a great place to reset for me. Stop, reset, reevaluate, and go again. But I watched a lot of people, friends, work colleagues who who, who went into meltdown, absolutely struggled with it, you know, and, and understandably, you know, yeah. if I didn't have that running or, or act, you know, even just getting out there for that daily walk, the well-being would have just gone down the toilet big time. I thought it was awesome, actually. You'd see so many people did uh, find the outdoors during yeah. de definitely the first lockdown. I noticed yeah. on my local trails, people who I'd never seen out before enjoying yeah. the sunshine, especially the weather was awesome. I think in yeah. May of 2020, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. we had a really good... Uh, I think I think most people bought bikes, didn't they? Because you couldn't buy a bike for love nor money. I think men especially, there seemed to be a lot of middle-aged men on bicycles. Biking you know turbo I mean? trainers. There was yeah, a... oh, yeah. and then, then they went on eBay about a year later, didn't they? I think it's pretty much... <laughs> <laughs> awesome well before we talk about the thames ring uh 250 could we just share a bit about your running journey it goes back a long way i'm afraid so uh, as a schoolboy, i was i was always a big footballer um and i was never very fit so running was kind of my torture my pain to get fit um i remember going in the gym at an early age in my teens and saw this uh, half marathon sign come and join the, the gym team for a half marathon so I thought, oh, I'll join up and do like a relay piece. And then I got a bit greedy and thought, no, actually, I'll do it on my own. So that was my very first 
local half marathon back uh, 19 something or other it would have been i would have been about 18 19 so you're talking sort of 19 what am i to so you're about 19 90 ish <laughs> so back in the dark ages before internet even existed um so i did that and then like everybody else watched the london marathon as a kid and i said to my dad oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna run that one day and he kind of laughed at me um but i did i did i actually did my first marathon in 1993 st albans and that started a journey all these years later, 250 marathons later, I've been oh like, I've done London, I've done a London 11 times. It's took me all over the world. I've traveled. And that was one of my passions was to run and travel at the same time. So my running has taken me all around the world. I've been very, very fortunate to, to go and visit some beautiful places um, and run in some places that most people never get to run yeah. uh, and race as well. So yeah, I've been very, and I've met some, just some wonderful people. So yeah, literally, 30 odd years of running marathons and ultra marathons and dabbled a little bit in triathlon back in the day wasn't very good at that um could never ride a bike very well unfortunately <laughs> so i could swim or i couldn't ride a bike um and then uh, yes it's been it's just been a journey really of endless endless runs and marathons and races thousands and thousands of miles um and i've loved every minute of it yeah, that's quite Absolutely. a young young start, actually. And, unless yeah. you're a, maybe an elite athlete who's been running since he was six or seven year old, but for yeah. someone around, I think we're probably about a similar age. Um, yeah. I wasn't thinking about doing half marathons when I was eighteen. <laughs> I yeah. ran around the Comrades Marathon, the ultra marathon in South Africa, when I was twenty three, really? and that was after I think I'd ran three marathons. Suddenly, I got this crazy idea after running. I think I was reading an article in Runners World magazine back in the day, Comrades Marathon. Didn't realize it was an ultra. I just thought it was a marathon. South Africa and I thought oh I've never been to South Africa then realized obviously it was a 56 mile ultra marathon and then they called it the down run back in those days it's like <laughs> oh down run sounds fun I'll just do a down run and, it, and you know ugh, yeah it's so not. um but no it's not a down run it's up and down but um it, it was my start of my quest I suppose really and never look back but let's focus a little bit more now on the Thames Ring mm. which you've done quite a few times you were just telling us before we started mm. recording about your sort of journey so why don't we just start right at the beginning we've got about 40 questions left. okay i'll talk really quickly then how it started yeah your 2017 stood on the start line as a rookie novice you tell us about what it is because people might be listening going yeah. what is this okay so thames ring 250 is the thames ring official path so it's not the thames it's the thames ring path starts at goring on thames and does an anti-clockwise loop of two it's actually about 260 plus but we call it the 250 and you run from goring along the thames into london then you get onto the grand union canal all the way up the grand union canal up to sort of leamington spa where you join the oxford canal come over the top and then down down through banbury join the um the thames again at oxford and then you finally come back through abingdon and back to goring so you start where you finish um flat route as i said trail riverbank canal um yeah to say very flat apart from locks that you're going up and down there's about 175 locks you cover um stunning route beautiful countryside and i'd grown up very similar sort of territory so i knew it very well i knew the grand union i knew the river so for me it was just bolting on the different extensions of places where i trained and raced um, and I have a bit of affinity with it because it goes past my own hometown, the Leighton Buzzard on the Grand Union Canal. That's got a lot of memories. And the canal I spent many, many years on it. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great race. Every, it's every year now. It used to be every two years. It's moved from June to April. Um, about 50% dropout rate-ish, probably a little bit more this year. I think we had 24 starters and 12 finishers. Yeah, about 50%. Also a real intimate field, yeah. Yeah, it is. And you get all sorts there, all sorts of people trying to just step up to take that next you know, next bit from doing like a 150 or 250 doesn't sound too bad. And I think people do get caught out on that next 100 miles. It's uh, it's a bit of a killer when you go into day three and four. <laughs> so I know you've done it multiple times. We chatted quickly before yeah. we started recording, but... So how did that evolve from um, some successful attempts in at, at a DNF, but then, you know, I'm going to do it twice now. What, what, what was the journey? Yeah, so 2020, 2021, sorry, I, I finished the, in a good time, I've done it in about 76, I was a new PB, and I finished with a guy called Nathan Taylor. Nathan and I had hooked up at Milton Keynes. We spent the last 100 plus miles together and really got a really good bond. We came over the finish line and I kind of looked at him and said, I think we could do that again. And he just looked at me like, oh, you're crazy <laughs> fool. And I said, no, look, if we can find a why, um, I think we could do it again. I think we enjoy it. Let's do it together. 
Um, anyway, a year evolved and, and, and it happened. It, it, it was born and we both agreed we would start the, the Thames Ring 250 double. Um, so, yeah, four days before the race, we um, we set out. And, and, and again, the reason for doing it was for charity, for um, King's College Hospital. Uh, Mark Mark Thornbury, who was a good friend of ours, uh, sadly lost his battle with liver cancer um, in 2020. Yeah. Um, and he was a, an advocate and a great fundraiser for King's College. So when he passed, it was about keeping up his, his good work. So that was our why. Um, you know, liver, liver cancer is one of those cancers that's very unknown. It's a very small cancer. I think it's only 2% of what overall cancer is. Um, however, when, when you're diagnosed with it, um, you know, if, I think it's 17 people a day get diagnosed with liver cancer. 15 of those will die. Um, it's very underinvested. It's the 18th most common cancer. So it's one of those that doesn't get the investment. So that was a big why for us. And, and that got us on the start line to, to go and tackle the two and yeah. be you know crazy enough to think we could do two as well under all the same restrictions all the time limits you know whatever time we finished in uh before the start that was our rest time so if we came in at 99 hours and 59 minutes we were walking straight back onto the start line mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been wise you know in the end yeah. got around in about 83 which gave me gave me personally 17 hours to to recoup um which was needed um i was pretty broken at that stage um sadly nathan uh just quickly on his journey so again we got through to night one and then then Nathan had a bit of a, a, a strange affair, uh, had a medical condition, which ultimately meant he had to go to hospital, which was really oh, yeah. gutting for him, gutting for me. You know, I lost my buddy on night one. Suddenly you're realizing this eight day crusade is now you're on your own. Yeah. And I had not planned for that to happen. And it, the, the, the loneliness really does get to you during the dark times. You know, when you've got a buddy there, and I found this back in 2021, when we were both going through our tough spots, uh, I think we both got each other out of the pit. You know, when the pain cave came, we were able to kind of talk to each other and support each other through it. And you don't realise having that company, how good it is. Because when you're out on the trail at night and you're deep sleep deprived and you don't know where you are and you're walking around in circles and looking, feeling a bit lost, having that person there is critical, mm. you know, just to keep you moving in the right direction. That's why I think why buddies are so important. You can't have buddies on this race either. So literally that is your ally so yeah that's how we got there um and we were bold enough or foolish enough or crazy enough to go let's give it to it'd been done once before Jarvis Barty had done it and okay I guess we wanted to follow in the footsteps of him is the fundraising page still still open yeah I've still got my just giving so maybe I can give it to you and we can put it on the link um, yeah, yes yeah, yes yeah, still open so yeah absolutely if anybody would like to just pop a few quid in there absolutely you know the fundraising never stops um funny enough I did one 12 months ago I did the double grand union um I called it the fun run and that was for Mark as well and Goodness. that was raising a bit of money and I think there's a few of us out there now doing the same but yeah happy to put the link it's still open it's just giving page yeah. um any 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 small amount would be hugely appreciated as I said totally underinvested and too many people are dying of liver cancer uh, and Mark was a very very fit guy you know it's not like it was an unhealthy guy very fit guy so any of us can be taken out with it um, and that diagnosis is pretty, um, pretty fatal. I think only 10% of people survive over five years. And that's, that's, that's crazy for cancer. Yeah. yeah, that's just not acceptable. When you think of so much research and work that's been done with other cancers now and the survival rates, which is phenomenal and fantastic, liver cancer is falling way behind. So we need to get that one back on the uh, agenda and get people and raise awareness, definitely. Yeah, keep talking about mm. it. Yeah, yeah. Let's dig a bit deeper into this. Yeah. Uh, you've made it sound like you sort of went out, ran round, stopped, had a little, <laughs> ran around. Yeah. Let's uh, let's dig a little deeper. There's more to the story. Um, okay. Tell us some highs, some lows. What was your oh, high? Oh God! What was your lowest point? I, think, I, really I, I just know the lowest point. To be honest. Oh, the fucking team, many lows. High points are uh, just. I felt very humble during the eight days of having the, just being able to do it. You know, I remember on day four. My back had gone into spasm. I'm 20 miles from the finish. And although this is probably a low, it's also a real high. I couldn't stand up straight. My back had gone. And I had to get a, a stick from the side of the trail to lift myself up like Gandalf, just to straighten myself up. I remember walking uh, up towards Benson Lock on the Thames. The sun was out. It was a beautiful day. I was in agony. But I remember thinking to myself, you're so lucky to be doing this. You're so lucky to be experiencing this it was just unbelievable. So they were just some of the strange highs of just feeling humble and being able to get it done. Even though I know I was in pain, I knew Mark would have been in pain for three years. So I kept saying to myself, 
this is nowhere near as bad as having terminal cancer. So yeah. get your head straight, smile every minute. And I did. I smiled on that last day to my crew. I smiled to everybody I saw on the trail. I, people look at me and go, what's this guy walking with a stick for? You know, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to share the why I was walking with a stick because that would have given pain a voice. So that yeah. for me, they were just some of the strange. I think the people you met, I met on the trail asking you, you know, what are you doing? And oh my God, is that is that possible? Well, just funny moments, you know, little strange, funny little quirky people you met on the route. Um, the other runners during the main race were fantastic. I remember there's a couple of the guys from Sweden I hooked up with, and they were so they were like family, you know, they were just sharing your moments with them, um, just talking about life in general. And that's what for me running's about. It's the social element, you know, and all of my pains and sufferings just vanished because you're chatting to people that you highly respect and they admire you, and they're looking at you going, how are you doing this? You know, we're at hundred miles and you're at 350 miles. It's like, how are you still running? And it's like, I don't know, really. Um, yeah. So they, they, there was some wonderful high seeing your crew. Of course, finishing is, is great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's a wonderful feeling to have two Tim's ring, 250 medals in, in both hands going, yeah, I've done it. You know, I know I'm one of two people that managed to, to achieve that. Um, but yeah, there were lots, lots of small little highs all bolted together. I think the lows, wow, Jesus, where do you go? The pain cave this time round was very, very um, severe. The sleep deprivation on loop two, which I'd never experienced to that level. Um, the pain, um, trying to protect the back on the second loop because that had given up on the first loop. And, and I think the voices in your head of just, I call it the demons, just wanting you to give up. You know, they keep stripping away at you. They play on your insecurities. They work on your weaknesses and being able to override those voices. And I, and I say, in the, I used to fear the pain cave, but now <laughs> I talk about going into spa in the pain cave. You know, I, I face the devil head on and he will punch very hard, yeah. but I will punch back twice as hard. It's a bit like I always class the, the devil as a bully and I hate bullies in life. I've, I've always hated bullies ever since I was at school. So when I look at the devil and he's really trying to put me down and wants me to quit because it's so easy <laughs> and he'll punch me really hard, that's fine. I'll get back up and I'll punch him back twice as hard because I've always learned only way you deal with a bully is stick up for yourself, yeah? yeah? So you punch the bully back and suddenly the bully goes away. Suddenly that voice becomes less. But it came backwards and forwards. The hallucinations were very, very vivid this time. I mean, I've had hallucinations. This time around, they were quite negative hallucinations. I'm scared of clowns. So I, I always have the IT, the it clown from the horror movie hanging upside oh down on the movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it glares at me. And, and it, this time around, it actually, for the first time, started to talk to me, which is a bit surreal. Um, normally, it just glares at me with its arms crossed. And it won't let me go under the bridge. This time, it was like taunting oh. me. And I had to keep getting there and going, you're not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me. And then it just vanished. But came back several times in the second loop, which is quite scary. Are you uh, aware, though? I've never had an hallucination. Are you aware... It's not a pleasant experience, but are you aware this is an hallucination? Are you completely invested in that, that moment? Um, it's, sur it's surreal because you're actually there's two of you. It's like you're watching yourself from over here. You're looking in. It's you can't you can't stop it. So yeah. you're like you're behind a screen and you can see yourself in the moment. You can see yourself walking towards, and you're trying to say to yourself, "It's not real. It's not real. It's not real." But I'm afraid you are fixed in the moment. The brain is a clever device, and Goodness. when you're that sleep deprived, you know I had literally hours of sleep when it should have been many many hours I, I got one or two hours over eight days so you are and they always say it's the greatest form of torture isn't it sleep deprivation and this was this was sleep deprivation and it's greatest so those yeah the hallucinations you, you're in the moment but you I've learned I, I guess I learned this time to talk my way through it so I, I started talking back whereas I'd feared them before now I talk, and they vanished then they, they just like pop like a bubble uh, because once you start fighting back, your brain suddenly goes, shit, what's going on? And mm -hmm. then you're fighting back. So they vanish and they go just as quick as they come. Uh, but yeah, they were quite vivid and yeah, weren't, weren't very nice, quite aggressive. Um, every, every tree turned into a really angry animal or an angry person um, or, or a dog. rage in your, uh, some people just <laughs> see like stars. And... I, and that's funny because on previous Thames rings, I've always seen things like polar bears. I've seen um, trees turn into frogs. You know, you've seen giraffes on the canal bank. They've always been quite funny. This was a dark one. This yeah, was just to a whole new level of darkness. Deep, yeah, deep, so, um, and you know, it didn't kill me, you know, and I realized, I kept saying, it's not going to kill you. Uh, it didn't kill me. And, and, and that's what I keep saying, it's not going to kill you. 
these are scary, but they're not going to kill you. They're just they're just your brain playing tricks on you. Just override it, and that that override switch and finding that override switch is critical. You know, getting in and out of that pain cave for me, I will override that voice very quickly now and go, no, you're not you're not going to take me down. You can punch me as hard as you like. I am going to get back up. And the pain for me of DNFing is way more than yeah. than the de- than the pain I feel out on the on the the um, on the trail. And that's and how I equate it. When you're running that far, yeah. that, that, is, that is how deep you're prepared to go. Did you have a sort of mantra that you, you repeated to yourself? Yeah, don't don't give pain a voice. Yeah. I just wouldn't, and, and I think there's just two or three I had. Don't, don't give pain a voice is a critical one. What comes out of your mouth is critical. I think the power of the spoken word is critical. You know, I kept saying to myself, you know, we don't quit, we don't quit. You know, quitting is not on the table. And I kept saying yeah. it, quitting is not on the table. And I sounds very, very harsh, but I'll always have a very, very big why. Mark was my why. But if you, I always have a, what I call a gun to my head scenario. And if you think about who, who is the most important person in your life, it might be a spouse, it might be a partner, a husband, a wife, a girlfriend. And Caroline for me is the most important. And basically, if I don't finish, I have to pull a trigger to her head. And that's how extreme I take it. So mm-hmm. you've got a choice now. You either survive Goodness. or you pull a trigger on her head. And I visualize that. I visualize pulling a trigger to her head. And I'm not going to ever do that. And I will never do that. So again, your brain will go, okay, there's got to be an alternative to this. And there is. Just keep moving. Just keep moving forward. It hurts. Just get on with it. It's one step yeah. at a time. Break it down. You know, one checkpoint at a time. You don't need to quit. Your brain, you know, your body and your brain are, are working together to make you quit. Um, override the switch, turn your brain off, you know, override it, and your body will do you massive amounts. And it was incredible what the, the body can achieve. So, yeah, it takes it to a whole new level of um, psychology. Uh, but I find it quite fun. I, I actually quite enjoy it. I quite enjoy now because it's not a place to be scared anymore. It's not a place to fear. As I said, I go in there to spar now. And once you've learned how to adapt your mind to overcome those sort of fears and insecurities of the pain cave, the world's your oyster. You know, but yeah. not many people are going to take them to that level of pain. You know, it's a bit sadistic, isn't it? You know, who wants to go and enjoy pain? Well, I know on the other side of that pain is going to be fun. It's going to be blissful. Uh, and I've just got to get through it. And I know that I'm going to get through it. You know, it isn't going to kill me. And if it does, I'm going to die enjoying it, aren't I? So I'd rather die enjoying it than, than not. So for me, it's about just, just try and enjoy it as well. Have some fun with it. And it becomes a game. It does become a game, and uh, it's amazing how one step, one step, one step, one step, and next thing you know, you're at the next checkpoint, and you reset again. You know, and you, you have might the thought, same crew for the whole. Yeah, so pretty much, yes. Yeah. So I have my partner Caroline is the chief honcho, is the boss, as we call her, and she is the fundamental decision maker. Um, and then I had John, who's a very good friend, who's the driver. So we had a van that would go around and meet me each near Nathan at each checkpoint. Sadly, when Nathan had to drop and went into hospital, everything kind of went a bit upside down. So we went into problem solving mode, but Nathan came back out with us and, and helped crew the second loop, which was great to have him. A, a I knew he was alive uh, and B was kind of okay. It was just to have him there, even at the checkpoints was just, it's a nice feeling of yeah. you, you're not alone. Cause you'd, I'd spend six, seven, eight hours on my own, even in the race, you know, I was, I was towards the back. You know, I was chasing the cutoffs and I didn't see many people on day one. It did feel very lonely. So having having my crew there were great. And they were and I had um, Naomi as well. Um, can't forget Naomi. And, and they are all taskmasters. You know, Naomi and Caroline are tough love merchants. Yeah. You know, they when when I'm when I'm when I'm going, I think I can't do it. It's shut up, get on with it. You know, there is they know Caroline knows me, you know, you're gonna have wobbles and, and I'll and I'll ride the wobble and I'll get through it. And I think she's learned now, unless I break something, just keep patching me up, get me back out, feed me, get me back out. I'll do the rest. I think um, it's brilliant when your crew knows you so well. And um, it's quite a fine line to tread sometimes if you're supporting somebody, uh, when to push and when to nurture. It's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Caroline has said, knows me, we train together and she knows what I can do and she knows what sort of wobbles I've had. So yeah, this, you should never put me at risk, but she knows there's a lot more out there to be done. And what, like I said, when your brain's given up, the body hasn't given up it's just it's just telling it so she knows with me just push him and i've not yet broken so you know i think she's got confidence i can do it so and that gives me the confidence then to trust yeah. her Thank to you. say is this okay just get on with it you know but i'm in pain doesn't matter get on with it yeah. you know um yeah it's it's it's, it's absolutely the be all and end all. i wouldn't want to have to do it on my own <laughs> it's you know that sort of eight days is a hell of a long time 
Well, I've been amazed by how mindful you've been, you know, um, the pain of failure is worse than um, the, the, the quitting and stuff like that and not being mindful enough to smile, all that psychology constantly at play. I think it's it's really impressive. Yeah, I think you'd, I just couldn't do it otherwise. You know, why, why would you make the eight days a chore? Why would you make the eight days a sufferance? Yeah. You know, you know, you're going to suffer, but actually just find some way of enjoying it. Like I said, Mark suffered for three years of terminal cancer and he ran ultra marathons during that time. My pain was nothing. Yeah. You know, and you, you, you can have a self pity party, but I, I, when I was having, and don't get me wrong, I had weak moments. Don't think I went through these eight days thinking I'm going to breeze it. I, I had moments when I wanted to quit. I had moments when I was thinking about where shall I quit? You know, you, you have, that, that's the voices, unfortunately, taken over for a short period of time yeah. before you punch yourself in the nose and go, get on with it. Don't be such a, you know, worse get on with it um and, and i had to punch myself in the nose a few times so yeah listen don't think me wrong anyone listening to this don't think i glided through this with a breeze um i went to some very dark places um where i'd never been before and i mm. thought i'd been to most but this was <laughs> this was a whole new anyone thinking about doing an eight day uh, just be mindful you know the sleep deprivation will uh, will certainly play uh, its true part uh, how did so how how did you train for this sort of um, yeah so i alluded to so my my training wasn't good enough simply because i didn't get in the gym enough so i should have been in the gym so my my strategy was um about 15 16 weeks i've got my base already was to just use some good strong mileage and get used to the back-to-back -back sort of 30 milers 30 35 milers so that you were used to doing a good 30 35 mile and getting back out the next day knowing how the body was feeling and that was trying to emulate finish loop one go to loop two um, I kind of said to myself, try, I'd, I'd planned to do eight 100 mile weeks back to back. They never materialized. I got up to about 85. I think I squeezed a 90 because the back had gone. So I'd, I lost, I lost a lot of mileage in the later sort of five or six weeks, although I was tapering off. Um, I didn't feel I'd put probably quite enough mileage in that I would have liked, although it wasn't a problem. I, I still had enough fitness to get me around. But the, the physical side of it, um, because I was suffering with a bad back going in, I was on a chiropractor table for five weeks, literally in February and March, uh, put me back together again. So that didn't help. So I was very mindful of that. So I think if in an ideal world, I would have done more miles and I would have put more um, more time in the gym. Absolutely. I would have absolutely done the PT work, but it, ne it never manifested. Um, so therefore, I had to suffer a little bit more <laughs> while I was out there because of that. You know it made it more interesting do you often would you have put in sort of interval work or would that have had no place in your sort of training would it all have just been easy miles long slow or flat unfortunately because yeah and I, I like to spice it up don't get me wrong i like to do some hill stuff i like to do the interval stuff but now this was all about managing the body the mind the legs to emulate as much as i could about long slow running um, and my body got very used. And I think the, the important bit was the nutritional during training, lots of practice for nutrition, drinks. My drink strategy has never been great. And I found uh, I found what I think works for me now uh, on the training spell. So I, I only really drunk three kind of drinks. I would drink, I'd drink a little bit of diluted Lucozade Sport, um, fizzy water, which is the newest addition to my running. I like fizzy water. I don't get a stitch with that. I endeavor to try and stay off the sugary drinks. They always make me sick. So I kept off them where I could. No sickness this time at all, which is surprise, surprise. Easy. And I also, yeah, and I also like to drink um, to line my stomach. So at the checkpoints very early, I was drinking skimmed milk, which for some people find really strange, but I can drink skimmed milk, a bit like a milkshake. It just settles my stomach and it allows me to take on the fizzy water. I think when I start to mix the um the sugary drinks you know you coke the iron brawl that starts to play havoc then so i have to try and really minimize that but yeah but no i think this this was all about managing um the recovery from finishing of the night and getting back out on your second long training run and emulating that tired leg feeling you know that slightly dehydrated and then getting back onto the nutrition so i practiced all of the foods i was trying to eat on the leg so not so much what i was eating at the checkpoints but this was more out on the runs you know the energy bars the flapjacks the various different things that i like to stomach and i can get without making me feel sick you know the gels again i use one particular type of gel and i just practice with those um and then everything at the aid station i kind of knew what i was going to eat just because of past experience really when you'd finished the race yeah. um what was your savoury? What were you, what had you been dreaming of? For uh, uh, this <laughs> is always the same. Always the same. Bacon cheeseburger. Oh, that would hit the spot, wouldn't it? With a, with a, with a, with a, do you with have a... anything like that en route? No. Did you 
Oh, uh, no, no. Very, very carby. So Caroline would be making me mashed potato because we had the van, mashed but cheesy mashed potato, salty bacon, spaghetti or, or like noodles, you type of, you know, sloshy little bit, tiny sausages, easy to swallow, easy to digest. Because, you know, it's like I can't swallow after a couple of hundred miles. So this had to be quite moist, quite mushy, good calories, get some salt content back in, you know, just some good carbs. It was easy to digest and then get going again. Mm. And I found that worked well for me. And then I had um, cheesy uh, macaronis out of the little tubs. I love that. Uh, one, anyway. yeah, yeah, anything. I mean, this 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 particular race, I ate more than I've ever eaten in my life in a race. Oh, I, good and job. It, was, it was absolute bliss for me. I mean, I, I think I actually put weight on in this race because I <laughs> ate so much, which was for me, looking back, one of the high points because I didn't crash from bonk at all. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't sick or felt sick at any time out of 173 hours, which for me is a miracle. Um, so this time around, my nutrition was bang on. And I will take that to the next one and I'll tweak a little bit, but actually I'm going to emulate that. And then I think once you get your nutrition right, you get your hydration right, um, they're two critical ones over that period of time. Yeah. Don't try anything you haven't tried before. You know, I'm not I'm not a big lover of variations of food. When I got to the aid stations, if Caroline wasn't there, I'd be very mindful. What am I having? You know, salty potatoes, that's fine. Spaghetti noodles, that's fine. Pot noodles, that's fine. Stuff that's quite easy and moist just to get down. Mm -hmm. Why not set the tummy? Basically, um, a student's diet. You're yeah. What I, what I did have, I'll very quickly say, this is my one funny thing. On Latin Loop One, I got to night three. I came through Oxford at one a.m. in the morning, uh, and I'm absolutely starving. And I got to the Oxford Bridge, where the train station is. Across the way was like a little oasis called Domino's Pizza. <laughs> and I and I thought, oh, it's bound to be closed, but the lights were on. And I went up to the window. It said three a.m. I got in there. Young girl behind the desk sees this guy with a head torch pack smelling probably horrendous and she said how can i help you i said right this is my order i want a margarita don't cut the pizza don't want the box and she looked at me and said what the hell she said D just just don't cut my pizza and i don't want to and she's like i've got to give you a box i said so I don't cut my pizza so she gets the box opens it up to show me i said right so i rolled it up into my burrito i took the box out put it in the bin and i walked down um, towards the River Thames with this great big juicy pizza munching away, <laughs> didn't touch the sides. And that was at 1 a.m. It's a bit like, you know, being, and all these drunks in Oxford, you know, on their kebabs, you know, there's me fitting in perfectly with this dodgy pizza. Mm. And off I trots down the Thames, happy as merry as anything. And I finished a whole lot. I mean, it's a big pizza. <laughs> and it was just a story that you never forget because I, I felt like I was one of the night crowd. <laughs> yeah, they were, you know, they were, they were staggering, they were having their kebabs, there was cans of lager, and I was just, it was quite busy at one o'clock in the morning around there, and I was, and I just fitted in perfectly with my dodgy pizza, <laughs> you know, um, looking like some thinking, homeless geezer. Thinking of we. She's yeah. reliving this story on the Domino Pizza podcast about this. Yeah, but <laughs> that pizza, I can taste it now. It was yeah. just unbelievable. When I had cheese down my eye, tomato sauce. God yes. knows what I look like. I probably had tomato sauce around my face. I didn't care. <laughs> didn't care. It's 1 a.m. You know, I'm, I'm about yeah. 30 miles from finishing loop one. I'm just before everything fell apart with my back. And I'm thinking, I'm in bliss now. I'm how, in bliss. How, can how, you did, not? how did that 17 hours feel when you finished loop one? Oh. You know you're going again. Did you oh. think, I can't, I can't? Or were you yeah. very it, mindful that you well, were? Yeah, you have to kind of see the video of me on my social media coming in at the end of loop one. I look like I've been. 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. Yeah, I've seen I, it, am, yeah. <laughs> I am not in a very good place. The back is gone. I can't stand up straight. Caroline must have thought, oh my God, I don't know. Well, everybody, everybody kind of went, oh shit. There's not, I mean, the guys that came out that were running the race that very kindly came out to watch me finish quietly, didn't tell me after the race had finished, the whole went, he ain't getting around on loop two. Not <laughs> a hope is he getting on loop two. He is broken. You know, this guy is physically broken. And those 17 hours, I could write you a book on just those 17 hours. It was like clockwork. The team, the, everybody jumped into action to fix me, fuel me, hydrate me. The stuff I got done in 17 hours, most people don't get done in a week. It was incredible. <laughs> I could do a whole podcast just on what happened in 17 hours. But ultimately, fueling, rehydration, physio, retaping, washing, shaving, showered and bathed stretching repacking retaping all got done and trying to find eight hours sleep yeah um, yeah and, and i woke up about um what time did i, I wake up at 6 a.m on race day morning it's a 10 o'clock start 
And my first test was when I stand up, I'm going to walk over to the full length mirror, which was in there. Let me see how wonky I am. Because I'd gone to bed slightly wonky. Yeah. And I woke up, so I'd had my physio and, and I woke up straight and I said, right, is my back hurting? No, right, you're going to get this done. And I remember going down to check in on, on the race day and people were kind of looking at me going, holy <laughs> shit. He's standing again. You know, yeah, how has he recovered so quick? Some people as well didn't know you'd done a lap and then were looking at you starting going, uh... I think well, I most, imagine the jungle uh, drums would have been... Yeah, beaten. most of the guys had known and Lindley had, uh, had talked about it. Again. I think everybody pretty much knew yeah. within reason there was an idiot out there. <laughs> Weren't quite sure who he was, but knew, knew that there was an idiot. And, and ultimately, the, the mantra of the run, everybody, was stay in front of Paul because if Paul comes <laughs> past you, you're having a pretty bad day. And, and sadly, I, I made it my conscious effort, and it's a bit egotistical. I was never going to be at the very back. That was never going to happen. I might be two from the back in the race, and I always had two or three behind me initially, and that was the goal. Keep moving, keep moving. If I've got people behind me, that's good. Brilliant. Then, then yeah. in day two of the race, I overtook seven people. That's a real ego boost when you're at, you know, 350, 400 miles and you're overtaking people at 120. That's a great feeling. Suddenly from nowhere, you get energy. You find an inner strength, you know, and I literally overtook seven, and literally legs from checkpoint three to four. So yeah, three to four, four to five, five to six. I think I overtook seven or eight people in the race. Now that doesn't sound a lot, but for me, that was tipping them off one after the other, you That's know, and that, you know, and I thought, you know what, this is good. This is good. This is good. Just keep this going. Keep this, keep the steady push, steady push, you know, and then you get to a point where you go, right, I've got this nailed now. When did, yeah, when did you know? That was one of my last questions is when did you know you were going to do it? To be honest with you, real honest, it's going to sound a little bit big headed, standing on the start line of loop two. Once I knew the back was fine. I love it. There was no, there was no, there was no doubt in belief. Uh, the only thing that was going to stop me was two things. A broken ankle, broken leg. I just can't physically move. Or they, I'm going to get timed out. I was never going to quit. Never going to quit. Uh, and if and I was close, you know, the checkpoint three, I only had, by the time I got out the tent finished, I only had an hour, you know, an hour inside the cutoff. Now, normally I'd be four, five, six hours ahead of the cutoff. Mm. So this was pushing it. You know, there was an element of get your ass in gear now. Don't mess around. You know, that clock is ticking. You know, the ones behind you are going to get timed out. Don't let that be one of you. So, yeah, if I'm really honest, I stood on the start line. I had a moment to myself where I looked around and thought, the back is fine. The mental strength, I felt great. I felt on a, on a high because the recovery had been so quick and so well. It was a bit like back to those Sunday runs again. I got back onto that Sunday long run in my head yeah. of visualizing. How do I feel? I feel a bit dehydrated, but that's okay. Legs are going to be a bit stiff. That's okay. We've just got a 250 checkpoint time, checkpoint at a time. Don't worry about yeah. it. Because if I started thinking about the bigger thing, I was done for. You know, I couldn't think about the bigger picture. This was about breaking down checkpoint by checkpoint, each in my head. Get there at that time, get there at that time, get there at that time, and get through day one. Because day one's always the toughest with the cutoffs. If I could get through day one and get to checkpoint three at usually, still in the race, still in my head and body, fine. And, and I got to usually and I'd, I'd had a bad night. I was very, very tired. But once I left Usley and, and charged up to, to Burka, I thought, yeah, this is this is going to really definitely, this is good now. We're back in the game. We're back in the game now. It's great yeah. to hear you. I know you said it, maybe it sounds a bit cocky, but no, it's not. I think it's really impressive when yeah. someone backs themselves. I think oh, I always I love to hear that. Um, yeah. No one else is going to. No, yeah. I believe, belief yeah. is critical for me. You know, yeah. I'm just an ordinary, I'm an ordinary guy. An ordinary, I'm not a good runner, actually. I'm a very ordinary runner. However, I've got the ability to find a way of going very long. You know, I'm not fast, but when you can go very long, it's a bit like um, hare and tortoise, isn't it? You know, the tortoise will win. You know, it doesn't matter how much you fly out the blocks, you know, that tortoise is just going to keep methodically doing it. And that's what excites me about the future is, you know, if it's going to be longer and there will be longer, it'll be the same again. It will be, you know, slow, steady, sensible, run with your head, um, you know, and, and, and just take the journey as it comes. Well, that's my question, actually. Yeah, what next? What are you looking at in the future? <sighs> Yeah, I get told off when I say this. So in my, in my head, and this is only in my head because I get told off by the missus, because look, there's two sides of it. What I want to do and logistically are two different things. Logistically, the time, the money is huge. Yeah? yeah, it's all very well me rocking up and going, I want to go off on a 12 day um, voyage. But it, it, it's the whole support module of time and money. If I do something going forward longer, I'm probably going to need to get some sponsorship because I funded everything myself this time. And just hiring a van for eight days, you're talking 1200 quid. 
that yeah. you know that doesn't roll out the bank very easily my partner had to take extra time off work so did john take time off work that's lost earnings for for them so there's a logistical piece i've got to think about and be not selfish because i think we're all a bit selfish when it comes to ultra running can i go to 750 800 900 thousand would i want to go 30 yeah i would love to i'd love to go and explore that because the 500 wasn't in my opinion as good as it could have been it could be better and yes i could go back and do it again a bit faster but that's not the goal i know i can hit 500 not being physically strong enough so if i'm physically strong enough mentally strong enough and i've got the fitness in what can we then achieve clearly there'll be more if i want it the why will be big enough so i don't know what the next thing is i'd love to do 750 i'd love to go to a thousand because that's just a journey that no one can even comprehend um transcendence race in new york which is what 3100 mile 56 day kind of oh, race. wow that'd be awesome that, would be that awesome. type of thing you know everyone jokes i run across america look when, when i'm out there running that's when i'm at my best that's when i'm at my happiest so why not be at your happiest as much as you can be what about you the backyard know? formula do you think that would suit yeah you? i've done it once um i blew out last year about 130 miles with stomach problems again poor poor decisions made with nutrition and hydration I will go back and give that another crack. Um, I'm not sure if that format is right for me. I don't know if I'm quite quick enough once you get to about 150, 200, because you've got to keep that sort of four mile an hour going. And, and in this Thames Ring 250, I wanted to keep that four mile an hour going as long as I could. So other than the sleep deprivation, which does catch most people out, and just staying, having enough time to recoup at the end of each lap properly when you get to 150, 200, 250, 300, I know the guys out in Germany at the moment are, are very close to the record and, it, and it's just becomes real mental will then, yeah. you know, getting around in that 50 minutes, give yourself 10 minutes to just reset, re-go, refuel, a little bit of eyes shut and go again, you know, deja vu, deja vu. Um, what I do like about that concept is it's just one lap at a time. You don't think about how far you're going. And I would yeah. never talk about, I know John doesn't talk about John Stocker. You, you know, you always get asked how, how far you're planning to go till the last one drops out, you know, and it has to be quite arrogant. And John's always said that. And I've always been the same believer. You don't put a number down because once you put that number down verbally, that's it. You're going to break. If I said, I'm going to go and try and break 200 miles in the back, that's all I'm going to quit. And once I hit 204, I'm broken. I'm done. Psychologically, I'm out of the game. So again, it's not giving that, you know, the power of the spoken voice for me is huge. So it's when the last one drops out, you know, and the next one I go to, I'd love to stand there with John because he's a fantastic. I mean, he's the top, top guy, you know, everyone aims to try and be a John Stocker. I'd like to go and push John. You know, I'd like to get a Matt as well, who, who buddied him up last time. I'd like to just go head to head on a really great day. You know, when, yeah. it's, when everything's firing and just yeah. see how far we can go. Macaroni, uh, cheese is cooking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you just kind of visualize a perfect backyard and, you know, they talk about the 400 miles, the 500 miles and going beyond 500, and that will happen. You know, you've just got what to find the right. Um, something like a Le Jog. Lands into John O'Groats. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of my friends will be doing it next year, Mandy, and you know, I, I, I'm going to be watching her with a bit of uh, interest. You know, she's been on the show, Mandy. Been on Mandy the show. Boyster, yeah, yeah. Mandy Boyster, yeah, Mandy, yeah. She's going to be doing it next year. Um, and again, I did Thames Ring with her two years ago, um, and and we've pretty much almost finished together. Lovely lady and a, and a tough cookie. Again, obviously did the spine recently um so yeah um yeah i'll be watching on with interest it's something that's been in my mind but <laughs> haven't quite got there yet <laughs> lots we'll of lions in the fire <laughs> yeah let's just see how the other people tackle it but yeah definitely i watched dan lawson do obviously his record attempt going up um was it a couple of years ago wasn't it when he did his so um yeah we'll we'll see there's still a few years left in me yet we'll um we'll see what we'll, we'll see what we can do oh lots to look forward to yeah to do our quick five, is that a good place to move on to them? Um, <clears throat> right. Have we have answered any of these already? No. Okay. no. We'll give them a go. Okay, right. Yeah. <clears throat> You've got a sponsor. Um, everybody's got time off work. Where in the world would you like to go and run 500 miles? Where in the world would I like to run 500 miles? I think I would want to run 500 miles in uh, New Zealand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Both islands, south and north. Both islands. <laughs> yeah. Both <laughs> islands, yeah. Run run round New Zealand. Perfect. During um, the Thames 250 or 500, did you prefer the mornings or the nights? Mornings. Mornings. And if you... What was coming in the night? The clown was yeah, waiting. The clown. <laughs> it was like, Caroline, don't leave me. 
If you could only listen to one song for 500 miles, could you pick one? Yeah, the Proclaimers. I knew. Hey. <laughs> I've already been everyone's been, everyone's been saying that. that song. The Proclaimers, <laughs> I love that song. Yeah, I think that one is just got. It's just funny and it's just upbeat and. You can't but help but smile, can you, when you hear it? As I've we never were, got tired of listening to that song. As we were preparing song. for this interview, I was singing the song. There we go. Saying, I bet, I bet oh, I'd have been listening to that <laughs> the one. Claimers, absolutely. Yeah, the claimers. <laughs> and who would you take with you on a 500-mile run? Um, oh, that's Anybody. A really, that's Anybody. a really, really great question. There's so many great people out there. Um, oh, it'd be so unfair to say, because there's, everyone's got their own... I probably would go with Dean Conassis. Ah, uh, yeah. Let's go with Dino. Let's have a chat with you Dino. And Dino could be separated at birth, really. Yeah, people, yeah you'd be able to room with each other. Eh? He'd have loads of anecdotes. Slight Greek look there yeah. going on. He's got a famous pizza story as well, hasn't he? Dino? Yes, he does his pizza. Yeah, Dino, Dino. But there's so many. I mean, I could list you. F- I mean, if if the guy could run, um, would I? Nelson Mandela. But you can't run. Yeah, you want yeah. you need some. I think that's okay. I think we could. We I'll could have dinner with him yeah. after the race. So I'd sit around the table with Nelson Mandela, <laughs> definitely. Um, definitely the Queen. Nelson could be on your crew because Nelson would be awesome. But I have a story. I don't know if I'm allowed to share this story. But 1995, when I ran my very first Comrades Marathon at the age of 23, got to the end and I got to shake his hand, and he was more of my idol. But oh my, my biggest claim to fame, and this is thing I am so. Not proud of, but I was actually sick over Nelson Mandela's feet. Oh. And I got escorted away by his bodyguards. Oh, wow. Just... I projectile vomited over Nelson Mandela's feet. And I survived to tell the tale. <laughs> and I came to in the medical tent about two hours later. And these 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 kind of stories in my head came back going, I'm sure I wasn't sick. I was sick over Nelson Mandela's. I wasn't oh, like, oh wow. my God. Apparently I got I got carried into the first day tent by one of his one of his bodyguards. I clapped. Basically. Story. There we go. That's my claim to fame for, for, for not getting shot or arrested or spending a night <laughs> in jail. I physically sick over Nelson Mandela's feet. I don't think we'll ever top that on this podcast anyway. Yeah, that that's is. my claim to fame. That's what I'm going to my grave with. <laughs> well, this is quite a, a low bar question now compared to <laughs> Nelson Mandela chat. But um, you've got your bacon double cheeseburger. Are you yes. going for ketchup or HP on it? No sauce. No oh, sauce at all. Guys. Mayo, maybe. A bit of mayo. A bit of mayo. No, no, brown or red sauce. No, 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 no. Spoils the taste. Yeah, I'll have a little bit of mayo on the chips. Um, But you've got to make sure it comes with a a salty caramel uh, milkshake as well. Okay, you're moistening it like that. I can't, I won't name the name the brand. There's a favourite burger brand. It's not McDonald's, by the way, but it's my favourite. It has a number in the, in the title, so you probably would give it away. Uh, but they're my favourite burger brand, and that's what I have. Caroline will always spoil me after any long, so Thames Ring 2021, Thames Ring 2022. That is my go-to kind of recovery stroke swamp out meal. Swamp out. Yeah, yeah, just a slob out meal, as I call it. Extra big fries, big salt and caramel milkshake, and this dirty, great cheese and bacon burger, which is just... Mm. I just feel my body just sucking it all in. Oh, just bliss, just blissful. That's the only reason I do it. And, and, and then once I've had that, a little bit later, a bit of cake. Got to do cake. Yeah, you, need a break. Like, you need a bit of a break. Oh, I have a little bit of a break, but yeah, absolutely. This is Gary's normal diet. Yeah, it's just just like... a bit of really moist, like walnut cake with maybe oh, a bit of cream on it oh, as well. That's a top ten cake that is. That is a walnut cake with really, really nice, thick, yeah. creamy icing and, yeah. and, and double cream. Is just yeah, I, that's the reason to run, isn't it? Just so you can blow out on that food. Famish now. <laughs> Oh, Paul, awesome. thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I feel yeah. we've only dipped our toe into that adventure. Yeah. And uh, or thank you for sharing some deeper, <laughs> deep thoughts. I know lots of people that will be listening to this because like, a lot of people as well, they don't realise how the mental bat when they get to the mental battle when they start just having the mental battle and they they think that that's wrong and in some ways that's something to be scared of and i think yeah. a lot of people embrace it yeah 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 embrace, yeah. embrace the pain cake yeah don't be ashamed and, of it. No, the brain to overpower the brain it's part of the process yeah it is yeah um, but it's something to be scared of um, but also it's something you look it's not something that you can just go out and do that yeah. it is something that you have to learn and to practice mm. and you go a little bit in, you see what's in there, and you come back out again. And it is a, it is something that you get stronger with the more you do, and you're a testimony. It's like watching a horror movie if you don't like horror movies. <laughs> you, know, you might last five, ten minutes, and then bail out. But this is a proper, full-on horror movie. 
and, and you're going to experience a bit like in 4D. The chair's going to yes. move, everything's when going to shake. When you were describing your hallucination, I was thinking, God, this is like when I, the kids make me go and watch 3D films, it's and it. I have to keep telling myself it's not real because I get yeah. scared. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> like very real. Like jogger characters. I'm every, like, oh, I don't yeah. like it. Every sense is heightened, you know, every sense. So you can imagine it, a bit watching a horror movie 10 times in normal sense, and that's that's the that's the fun of your ultra pain cave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But hey, look, it doesn't kill us. That's what you remember. It doesn't I kill us. I tell our choice, and we do for fun. Yeah, Absolutely, absolutely. Good luck with your recovery. Keep Thank us you. Posted. If there's anything, uh, yeah, Run to Hills podcast can do with a support or Thank shout you. outs and any future endeavours, keep in touch. Yeah, and thanks for having me on. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye. so much Paul for coming on the show telling us frankly and openly all about how you deal with running such long distances and since we recorded that we he was quite tired so when we recorded it wasn't it it was a, yeah. uh, about 10 days ago and he was like oh I tried to run but it didn't feel good but since then he's been back and run the Royal Air Force um, marathon and is back to training again but people if you do do long stuff uh, there's no rush to come back no. There is no rush to come back. Everybody deals with recovery different. Everybody runs for different reasons. And if you feel you want to have a good lengthy period off, you do that and you enjoy it. I love this time. I really embrace I, it. I do <laughs> find it hard as a coach to not to to understand when people are like, I need to um I'm, I, to not give themselves a rest i'm like that's how i get myself around these things thinking yeah. oh, oh oh the two weeks after i'm gonna lie on that sofa and catch it's quite, um it's, it's, it's inconsistent as well because sometimes you look at some of the like the top elites you know i always mention kip chogi and i think they do really nurture this time but then you see other elites uh, it could be after say a hard marathon and they are the, the, the following week, they're, they're out jogging, jogging around. And I was saying, oh, wow. I understand the need for movement, for active recovery. I understand that some people's mental health relies on running. So I do try and like understand, you know, try not to be too judgy. But um, I think you need to look at the whole year, don't you? And the future years. That's what I'm always looking at. Yeah. I really want to be able to hike with my kids when I'm like 90. Perfect. It's exactly it. You want to be doing this for as long as possible. Right, we've got coming up South Downs Way 100 this weekend, the race of the year, one of my favourite races, Winchester to Eastbourne. Uh, weather's looking good, trails are dry, it's going to be fast, always a good field, always well supported. Centurion will be putting up their race preview soon if you want to do it. If you're running it, I'm sure those people that are big fans of the show are running it. Best of luck, pace yourself, don't go off too fast, get to our way fresh you got it they are pretty busy the centurion oh, it feels like every other weekend james. poor james he sent a voicemail the other day like i've not got free like it is relentless uh races and you just don't understand if you once i drove him round uh a lot a few years ago now the north towns way 100 i just drove him i was like his driver to all the different checkpoints and stuff there is so much admin to do yeah. for these races eat like getting all the stuff the checkpoints getting all the water and then as it's happening you've got people like you know ringing and people doing stupid stuff during the race yeah. And crew doing stupid stuff and landowners rigging. And oh my God, I would never want to be a race director. No. I couldn't do it. Well, I found Ooh, what, I what have we it. got coming up? Ooh, do, 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 do. <laughs> the <laughs> annual Swaledale Marathon. Um, it passes through some Swaledale's finest scenery. 23 mile course is a fell run challenge walk event. And we will self navigate ourselves and complete the course within 10 hours organized by the Swaledale Outdoor Club since 1979. So it's quite an established event that's good isn't it and i've always spoiler alert i am doing this i'm not racing it uh, i know that but um it's one i've always fancied doing and since i'm in this different season of running where i'm not chasing 100 marathons anymore it's been so refreshing that i'll do this now because quite often i had friends that were doing this stuff like, i'm doing it. it's, 20, it's 23 miles you might i'm not i'm not gonna have a big day out and it's not gonna count towards the 100 miles 100 marathons uh but yeah now i can and there's other things there's chevy chase which is naming it's another big day out uh that's coming up that's super popular but i've always turned my back on it but yeah this weekend is the swaledale marathon so yeah best of luck everybody so yeah i'm racing eddie oh racing not racing sandbagging <laughs> <laughs> what about yourself? <laughs> I've got two weeks of single parenting. Knuckle down, Eddie. Knuckle down and enjoy the road ride. Carb load. 
look after yourself, <laughs> set low treats. standards. Get the get treats the, in. Get the treats in. This is just for me. Quick food. No one judge the state of the house. But actually, you know, <laughs> I know people will understand this, is that when your husband or wife is away, why is the house so much tidier and cleaner? There's so much less stuff to do. I just get all admin. It's like, just do, do, do all my jobs, line the jobs up. And then Everything's stayed away. The kids, by the time, I always set myself a challenge in the morning that all the kids, by the time we leave the house, I drop the kids at school. I've The house is like all cleared up, beds are made, curtains are open, breakfast, everything's white, everything's ready. As if, I always imagine if I die in a car crash and then mum has to come and look in the house, she'd be like, he's left it in a very good state. Uh, so there's some big single parenting going on and every everything is so busy. There's so much going on. I don't know what to do. My diary's filled. So I've just got to stay alive stay alive fingers crossed the running will continue to build and i don't get mother my physio drew this this um these steps on the a piece of paper for me she gets me so much she's like okay so eddie you know um uh where it's gonna go up the step but then sometimes you need to come down the step before you then go up and you go a little bit higher i was yeah. like yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. i'll go and climb point <laughs> But I had did have a little rest day yesterday. I did do, and now that I can do more loading with the weights, <clears throat> it do, I do find a need to now actually start to follow a little bit more of like recovery, stress, okay. growth. Whereas the few weeks before, I've just been like, whatever I fit in, and it doesn't really matter. So, um, I think gonna... that's where a coach would be awesome for say someone like myself who self coach, where it does just seem to be more, more. I think it's the overview. It's the helicopter view, isn't it? Of yeah. um, uh, of just keeping an eye on the general, like, okay, you need to build, but in order to build, you also need to rest and yeah. really listen to the body. Yeah. Um, so I will keep building my running very nice and easy, but I had a moment when I was running today and I've not had it. Oh, Gary, I mean, I'm running routes that the last time I was on them, it was snowy. So it's months that I haven't been out in my mountain trails and I was like wow. running along. I also haven't listened to music because I think it's dangerous because I get carried away with the tunes <laughs> and I run, I start bopping and I run too fast and I'm not listening to music. I can just imagine you skipping around. <laughs> skipping around to a bit of One Direction. I I also put it on, so I did, I was like, yeah, I'm going to listen to some music, which I feel is a bit bad when you're running in the mountains because it's so beautiful, but sometimes it just felt like it. And so I put on repeat on my Spotify list and it was all Evie's like Disney classics. Uh, I was like, oh, move on, move on. Anyway, I was running, I was like, this is the first time, another step forward if you're on a, if you're following an injury journey like mine is when you run and you forget get about your injury and you just run and you're just running for the joy of running and there's no like worry about pain you're not out of breath I mean I was on a flat track which is slightly downhill so it was helping the heavy breathing oh, oh it was delicious it was a wonderful feeling I was like pat on the back Eddie you got yourself back here now steady away do not yep. get carried away don't get carried so I'm gonna away. with my swifting journey and I, and I haven't seen my bike fitness come through yet but it must do it must do it must be there i mean i i did was able to run uphill for like an hour this morning i couldn't have done that if i hadn't done all this swifting but i've definitely seen a big improvement in my bike power so come on let's get this put Ooh. this together and see what will happen my thighs are definitely bigger than they were so somehow this is going jeans help. tight <laughs> i never wear jeans that's something no one should ever see <laughs> i just live in lycra anyway continue fingers crossed this time next week i'll be like no i won't be like oh i'm running four hours it will be good anyway. i hope not <laughs> anyway what, what, what swell day swell days on saturday or sunday I think it's on Saturday. Yeah, I should check this. I? I should have a look at the. I just have a look at all. This I know. Book. I know the route really well because I've got um, a really nice client doing it, and so we've been breaking down the route for all his ah, long. Ah, okay. We're doing <clears throat> specific sessions to like mimic the start, yeah. it's uphill the start, um, and the checkpoints and stuff. So I've got I've got it written somewhere. I've wrote out the route profile to create all the sessions. You know more about it than me. <laughs> I don't you. know anything about it. I don't even know the kit list or anything. So I need to really uh, swat up on all that stuff. And um, yeah, I think it's about time I kind of dipped in for a bit of free coaching. Eddie. I need a bit of what do you reckon I should do this week? <laughs> uh, my session is uh, typically, you know, I do a long run, but my sessions for the week, they're big, big sessions. So I've got my classic five times one K sandwiched with the 10 minutes 
and then four times 10 minutes with three minutes rest. They're the two big quality sessions. And I think even the long run had a small section at marathon pace. And my goal for Swift... Like it's Tuesday now. Yeah. It's a race on Saturday. Saturday, yeah. I've not done any yet. So I was going to do one today and one Thursday, not do anything Friday. Uh, but my effort for Swale deal should be because it's really good. It's um, the distance and elevation mimics Lake 100, the ratios. So it's a really good uh, kind of test. And I thought, well, I'll just kind of try and do that at probably a bit above Lake 100 pace because. Yeah, because uh, you'd be out all day otherwise. I'll be like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so that was the effort for that. And then also the goal is I'd, I'd like to run Sunday too, you know, maybe kind of 12, 15 miles on Sunday. So, yeah, do I do both sessions um, or do I do one session and maybe then do a bike session? Um, look at the whole program, isn't it? I mean, look at the if you're going to put all that together and you want to run Sunday as well, how are you going to feel on Monday? Next but week, my, you know, I always think you do kind of wrong. consistency, consistency. If you do, you could definitely do all that this week plus the Sunday. But I reckon next week when we'll be recording, you'd be like, oh, oh I'm going to do one <laughs> session this week. So think about like. <laughs> Preserve, you want to walk away from this week, good training, but not have burnt all your matches. Yeah. You know, you can't. So I would probably choose one of those sessions to do. I do have another race. The Durham Dales is coming up, I think, the 19th of June as well. So they are yeah. coming thick and fast. I like, <laughs> so, yeah. I like four by 10 minutes um, yeah. because also that's going to be a little bit less um, tiring uh, than the five by 1K. But I would say you need to fuel during those sessions yeah. if you're going to be racing at the weekend as well four, where i'm really handicapped the four times 10 minutes should be uphill uh but we just don't have a 40 minute hill basically you know if i live mm-hmm. in the lakes and you could go and run skid or that'd be nice and easy peasy but um yeah we'll see maybe i'll see how i feel if i if i don't so do one to do it is that you feel during yeah. pre during and after all that this week so that you are not getting on empty yeah, well, I need to do that. I, yeah, be a bit more mindful if I, whichever one I do to feel better because I don't want to fade. You know, the first um, the first half of it, I was really impressed with. Oh, Gary, you're moving quite well here. Um, <laughs> look at me as I was prancing down the old railway lines. Um, but then as soon as you're about <laughs> two thirds in, it was like, oh. you went out, you went, yeah, oh, it's horrible. As soon as I hit, it was like, um, it started to get a bit more rolling. So as soon as I started going up stuff, it was just like there was nothing, nothing there, no speed. Uh, but like my heart rate wasn't too bad, but I just couldn't generate any more power. But yeah. I, hear you. I know exactly. <laughs> I did that exact for my hour run. <laughs> but yeah, it's really, you know, again, it's, if you, if you, I should have a chat with um, Sam when she comes on. What she did for a 145 uh, miler, but do I need to be doing anything at threshold, really? Well, you, we're some, we talk to people, don't we, that are like, um, no, I don't do anything. It's all no. vol- just it's volume. Free of a G. She just kind of it's, does what she feels on the day. And I work with clients that actually, as soon as they add in speed, they get injured and they, yeah. we look at different ways. There's no right way to, is that what you say, skin a cat? It's not very nice, is it? There's millions of ways. It's, was that was it? whatever the saying? More is. than one way. Something like that. More no than way. one. For God's sake, <laughs> us too. Honestly, anyway, everybody's different. You never do what anyone else does. Yeah. Do what you feel, and then see how you feel, and with blood, and respond to that. Anyway, what's there's big more big news than this? What's coming up, Gary? It's my birthday. <laughs> Day. When is hey. it your birthday? You might, you might not want to show it, share the exact date if people are going to steal your identity. <laughs> yeah, well, if I say when it is, then I'll give them the exact date. <laughs> it's, it's this week. <laughs> this week. Are you going to give yourself a treat of four by ten minutes uphill on your birthday? Yeah, what a treat that would be, a little birthday run. Uh, you celebrate no. your birthday? Do you love birthdays? Well, when they're approaching a bigger birthday, which won't be that far off. No, I'm not so keen on birthdays. How far but- off? Off we the big birthday. I want to be 49 this week, so. Sorry, Gary. Yeah, 49. I ho- hopefully on Sunday we're going to go for a family meal. There's a nice Thai restaurant near us, and I will enjoy that and a little wander around Durham. So that'd be good. But other than that, I bought myself some um, shorts from Scott. So I've got <laughs> bought myself a birthday present, basically. <laughs> and, Did you uh, yeah. in your house? Do the kids love a birthday? 
Yeah, well, it's a shame. Actually, Esme's like deep in exams, um, but she would, she loved to, she loves a bake, bake a cake, but um, mm-hmm. don't want any extra admin for her at the moment because she's, yeah, right deep in the middle of exams at the moment. But yeah, yeah, it'd be good. Lisa's brilliant. I'm oh, rubbish. You know what? Give someone's birthday and I'd oh, like. No yeah. offense, but all men are rubbish at birthday. <laughs> Lisa has the button up and everything. It's awesome. And then it'll probably just steal for Esme's birthday because her birthday is coming up again. So we'll have bunting up all of June. It'd be great. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. You're the best. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, and I don't think I'll be running on my birthday. So that'd be quite nice. Bit of a civvies day. Smart day. I'm hoping if anyone's uh, a lemon cake would be nice. Uh, you're a lemon cake fan. Lemon juice on. I do. Yeah, I've got a friend who makes cakes here for um, people's but you know people's birthdays or events and things. I just Facebook her when it's Bryn's birthday and go it's that time of year again. Lemon <laughs> drizzle, pick it up. I'll pick it up at four. Yeah, and I yeah. In. I'm not good at baking, so I don't even pretend I am. I oh, give I money to my friend who is good at it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Stick with your strengths. Let the people <laughs> so yeah 49 um but what is good you know this is my long-term goal is when i'm 50, get to 50. To, <laughs> yeah get to 50 Oof. and then be semi try and be competitive in the late 100 when i'm 50 see um that's a it's quite a long you grew up an age group in the marathon yeah or, 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 well nothing happens at 49 but yeah 50 everything um yeah i go up in age everything group. goes south <laughs> God, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Doing that all but again. that, like, county top sort of been banging on about for the past couple of months. That 100 year old combined age winning time is quite tasty. So that's a way off. Uh, maybe, you know, Parmos 110 could be competitive as a 50 year old in that and late 100. But it all depends. A, you've got to get to the finish, and B, whoever enters the race. You know, you could have someone like, say, Paul Nelson, who, uh, could rock up and then I'll probably don't know how old Marco Consani is Debbie's husband now I might be doing him a disservice now (laughs) Uh, (laughs) like 41 (laughs) awkward (laughs) yeah we'll keep it on the down I don't want to like invite loads of people of 50 year olds fast no I thought you were going to say I don't want to invite loads of people to my party I was like to go well I haven't been invited to this party I'd have flown over with my bunting I was waiting for my card Uh, Oh, you know, it costs like two pounds fifty to send a birthday card. Not even my mum and dad get one anymore. Oh, wow. like, well, remember that uh, parcel I tried to send you? But it's but it's with such love. Oh, it's with such love. That I'll think great. of something to send you. Just a picture <laughs> of me, maybe. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> An Instagram story. Stop it! Let's not talk about Instagram stories and inappropriate emojis you keep sending me. I don't think Gary understands how to send. <laughs> He's gone bright red because I just said on my Instagram stories, why do you always give like hearts and flame emojis? Like, I don't know. I don't I've only got about five things to choose from, and some of them are like that doesn't make any sense. Same. <laughs> <Yeah. out. laughs> I do need a. I need a little bit of like. I need to go on YouTube. Just or do a thumbs up. Just do the thumbs up. Don't okay. do the pervy. I've been told <laughs> pervy. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I love it. It means you look at. It means that somebody cares, isn't it? There's somebody out there. Yeah, I just I thought that I should interact more with people on social media. You don't media. need to interact with me on Instagram. That's all right. <laughs> uh, talking of interaction, if you Boy. like the show, my God, we've gone off on some crazy tangents. Yeah. If you like this show, like, share, subscribe, I don't know, but just do what whatever they say on podcasts and click buttons and say, give us reviews. We love a review. We have had a, a lovely review, and I'm not even going to attempt that uh, name. S-K-H-U-L-D-R. Skulder. Yeah. <laughs> very, you know, very concise, this one. Brilliant. I like this. Lovely hosts. <laughs> good chat. Interesting content. Fun and informative. There you go. I think that's just good chat. Interesting content. That's kind. Fun. Good. I'm always looking for the fun. (laughs) I'm in it for the party. Informative. Again, questionable. But I mean, if we keep people company, that's all we ask for. Yeah. Lovely hosts. Lovely. You're lovely. Stop it. Stop (laughs) it. He's sending me the flame emojis again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. Thanks for that. Really appreciate the review. 
Thank you to Cheer Charge for continuing to support the show, sending bars to guests, competition winners, and keeping Gary and I fueled in, well, in our hour runs and ventures. Gary need to eat more in your training sessions. Generally being a super round support to everyone out on the trails. Go and check them out at www.cheercharge.co.uk, especially they've always got promotions on. I think there's a promotion still happening for Run to the Hills Bandana. Go and check out their website, order up some bars for summer races and adventures. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Keeping me company. You're the only people I talk to all week. That was episode 93. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run to the hills. Ooh.